spring practices are over. The spring game has happened. And we're going to be joined today by Mitch Wolf of Eagle Insider to overreact to everything that we saw on Saturday. You are locked on Boston College, your daily podcast on the Boston College Eagles. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. This is Locked On Boston College. I'm your host, AJ Black, editor of Eagle Insider. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers get 150 bucks in bonus bets guaranteed. That's $150. Win or lose, visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On to get started. Let's get this podcast started. We have a busy episode today. We're going to talk about Thomas Castellanos and Grayson James. We're going to look at overreactions to that spring game. And I have recruiting updates you're not going to want to miss all of that on today's show. And of course, to talk football, we are joined by Mitchell Wolf of Eagle Insider. Mitch, how's it going? It's going well. Sadly, when I was in Vegas this weekend, they did not have odds or anything to bet on for BC spring game. I couldn't believe it. Uh, but otherwise, you know, it's always a fun game when one team is scoring, what, 96 points or something. Um, so yeah, it was a very, very interesting game. Lots to overreact to, which we'll spend most of the episode talking about. Do they have odds on uh, like the bigger teams like Alabama spring? Games? I should have asked, but I did not look. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I was yeah. asking about, I was asking about the BC hockey national championship odds, which they only had the regular, you know, money line, puck line and over under. And of course it did not win that bet. So, Oh, that's yeah. ours worse. <laughs> anyway. So we, we, on Saturday, we had the spring game. As I said on yesterday's episode, I kind of reviewed what happened. What were some of your takeaways, overreactions and things that you learned about this team watching, a glorified scrimmage. Well, sadly, my predictions about the wide receivers did not come true. Uh, Jerron Bradley had a pretty rough spring game. Uh, I think he only had one decent catch, had a few drops. Uh, and, of course, Luke McLaughlin balled out. Now, granted, a lot of his catches were on check downs where I honestly didn't think he had that much separation. Did a good job catching the ball through contact, but uh, just not a ton of separation and all of it with the second team. So I'm taking that with a grain of salt. Um, I think the most impressive part was the defense. You know, given that... Um, that was a big issue last year, especially down the stretch. And I would say a lot of the defense is back. Um, you know, most of the players that are there that were there last year are going to be getting a lot of, uh, similar, similar roles, similar playing time. Um, and I thought they looked a lot better. Um, and and again, it's the spring game, so it's hard to really gauge it, but, um, you know, you saw a guy like Dominic Araku have a bunch of splash plays, um, thought, they got a lot of different uh, interior defensive linemen going in different rotations. So, so I thought that was interesting. Um, you saw the, the new linebackers, which was cool to see, uh, seeing Sione Hala and Davian Crouch get a lot of run, which I think I'm very excited to see. Uh, disappointed we didn't get a lot of Bryce Steele, but makes sense. He's still kind of coming back from what he's going through. Did he play? Then, Cause I, I was, in the I same. don't think so. I haven't had the chance to actually rewatch the game, um, but I did not see, I don't think I saw really any of him. So I think he's kind of still just getting back to game speed. And then a lot of a lot of names in secondary. You mentioned um, Ryan Turner, uh, Max Tucker seems to be going with the ones, which I was kind of surprised about. And even though the guy I expect to be the starter, Brightquees Brown, had a bunch of plays, he did get a little nicked up towards the end of the game. I believe not on his interception return. Actually, might have been. I can't remember. But uh, I thought he had a good day. And then uh, uh, Bug Jones getting the Jay McGillis Award. That's pretty special. Uh, and it'll be really interesting to see what he can bring because – you know, he's been on this team for a few years now. We really just haven't seen a lot of him on defense. You know, I think he's played he's played on defense in, I think, three games, and it's all been in kind of mop-up duty. So, you know, it's interesting to see a guy who's getting that scholarship and getting that award who we really just don't know much about. So that'll be interesting to see what he can do in the fall. Yeah, Bug Jones was an interesting one because up until he started his own podcast and started popping up more, I forgot. I almost forgot that he was still on the team. Like, you just didn't see him all that much. Um, and especially when BC's secondary was struggling last year at the, se- at the tail end of the year, I was like, where is he? Like you figured he, and then all of a sudden now he's out there with the ones and you're, you're like, Oh, they have something there, which then leads to a lot of fans questioning Jeff Halfley's <laughs> ability to uh, mm-hmm. um, evaluate his talent, which we'll talk about in another episode. Um, now talking about that defense, um, the defensive line, what did you see in terms of uh, you? You mentioned Azaraku. Did, were there any other names that popped out? Did you look, you know, and notice like did Camp Horsley do anything special? I noticed Nigel Tate had a couple plays, and um, my favorite moment of the game was when Bill, I don't know if you could hear it on TV. Yep, yep, I know, I know where you're going. 
with Bill O'Brien say, uh, talk, w- w- I, you, could you explain it better? Cause I'm totally losing. Yeah. It. He was basically saying like, Oh, like let's, let's get Rooks out of there. Give me another D tackle. And I can't remember who he, who he was calling for, but they said, Oh yeah, get, get that, get that guy out. He's good. <laughs> yep. So that was funny. Oh no, um, I was actually talking about, there's another incident where oh. he got oh, the, the penalty. Yeah. Where he, he awarded, he tried to award the well, sack to Nigel Tate. And Nigel's was, like barking at him, like it was my sack, it was my sack, and he was like, "No, I think it was someone else." And then the refs came over, and was like, "Yeah, it was defensive offsides." And Bills, Bills, telling the the entire audience everything that's going on. So, I loved that. I thought that was such a cool. Uh, yeah, that was interesting. Uh, yeah. So, but the other name that you mentioned there, the guy who got the sack was Quintavious Hutchins, who had a bunch of splash plays, but including that quote unquote sack. But again, he was off early, um, and he's a bit hard for me to pin down because he is pretty undersized uh, for an edge rush. I think he's like six, one, two forty, which you can survive at college. If you're just a designated pass rusher, like Max Roberts, the transfer from Maine from a few years ago, who had a decent little season in 2020, but I'm not sure he's going to be an every down player, but I mean, if he's another body you can have on passing downs, that's good. But with him, some of his production is a little wonky. Um, like I think he had one sack where he was just unblocked uh, the way the offensive line slid away from him and then nobody blocked him and he got a sack. So, you know, it, it's like, okay, good. You made the play, but like I could have made that sack. So, you know, <laughs> and I'm not going to read too much into it. Yep. Um, yeah. So I, I was impressed by him. Like you said, Nigel Tatum, which was honestly, the offense couldn't really run the ball super well, which it's a spring game. It's, you know, physicality is kind of weird. I, you, you mentioned that the game was more physical than in previous years, but still, you know, they're still kind of trying to figure out, obviously, uh, you have a lot of different bodies in there. You know, if you Logan Taylor not playing because of a seem like hopefully a minor injury with the starters. So you got Dwayne out with the ones um, and then the second unit is rotating on guys. Even the first unit, you know, I think they had at one point they had Jack Funk and Kevin Klein in at the two guard spots. So, you know, you're still kind of working out the chemistry there. Um, so that so that was part of why the run game didn't go so well, I think. But also, you know, credit to where it's due, you know, guys like Nigel Tate, Quan Williams, uh, Owen Stoudemire, he got a pretty lengthy shout out during the broadcast. Um, so I, with the defensive line, I, I'm pretty okay with the defensive tackle rotation. Even I saw, I think I'm pretty sure I saw Tyus Clemens getting some snaps. That's good. Um, it seems like they're going to bulk him up and he's going to be a D tackle kind of in a similar role as George Rooks. Um, but that does bring me to the concern about the edge depth. And, you know, like I said, Ezra Rock, a great player, really loved his sideline of a TV appearance that he, I really like the way he speaks, the way he approaches the game. Um, Nedovic Paula has some talent, you know, he's had some inconsistencies, some mistakes that I'd like to see get cleaned up. Uh, Edwin Kalengi flashed very positively last year. Once Gilbert Tongrongu started getting snaps towards the end of the year, he was had some, had some little plays. And then uh, a guy like Clive Wilson, who has great length and height, he got some, he got like two snaps in the bowl game and both of them were good, but they got hurt in the second one. So we don't really know what, What's uh, what his deal is? We saw Josiah Griffin out there a good bit, um, which is interesting given that his brother's transferring. So there are some guys there, but a yeah. lot of them have question marks, and that's why I think in this in the spring portal window over the next few weeks, I would like to see BC be aggressive about finding an edge defender there who has played a good bit, can be kind of what Sheeta Salah was at the beginning of last year, where it's guy who has experience, he's a, a reliable run defender, and you know, has just been around the game more. And obviously, Neil Paul's going to be a senior in the series, played a good bit, but I just kind of want another body in there in case there is an injury because with the room as it's currently constructed, if, God forbid, Donovan S. Rocker was to get hurt, this would be a really not-so-great edge group. And I, I do think Edwin Kalengi is going to take a step forward this year, but I'd just rather have there be fewer question marks in the event of an injury that, that if it bites that room, then they're really in trouble. So folks that don't know the transfer portal has periods. They have the winter period and then the spring period. And right now on Tuesday, if you're listening on Tuesday, the portal has just reopened. And I also want to say, while we're, I got you guys all here, I would not be surprised if BC has a name or two or maybe a couple of people. You're like, wow, can't believe that person entered the transfer portal. And I just want to reiterate it's happening everywhere this is the new norm in college football and it's weird and i'm sure the coaches hate it because like they just went through this whole evaluation process with all their roster and they're going to probably have a few guys that are like yep peace out um i'm not sure who is going to be i and you could ask me we already saw joseph griffin exit um that was not a surprise to mitch or me we, we kind of both knew that was coming uh, but you could also see some other names pop up mitch before we hit our first break are there any other positions you think 
they should be targeting. I know there's kind of probably, like as I was just saying, there's if there's a surprise, they're going to probably looking be looking at to fill whatever that positional need is. But anything that you're seeing right now that they need to get. Um, one that a lot of people bring up on the Elon center board is interior offensive line. Um, they are understandably very concerned about the prospect of, well, let we'll frame it this way. You're losing Christian Mahogany and Kyle Hurgle. Christian Mahogany is definitely going to the NFL. I think Kyle Hurgle deserves a shot. I'm not sure if the NFL sees him that way, but he's probably going to get at least a camp invite and, you know, maybe he makes a training camp and impress some preseason or whatever. You're losing a surefire NFL caliber starting, starting guard and a, you know, guy who, I, if anything, if nothing else, Kyle Hurgle will probably get into the or the UFL and have some good playing time there. No, pretty much no matter who you're going to get, and nobody BC could get is going to equal that level of play at the guard position. Those players aren't available in the portal, and if they are, they're getting recruited by bigger and better schools in BC. So, if you look at the depth chart that BC has, you have Jack Conley, you have Kevin Klein, you have Dwayne Alec. Uh, and then you have some younger guys, even like Otto Hess and Jack Funk, who haven't played much, but they've been on the roster um, and they're, you know, good bodies and they've you know, been around there. I honestly believe a lot of teams in the FBS would are very, would be very jealous to have the depth BC has at offensive line because I know Jack Conley's not the best player, but him playing at guard mitigates a lot of the issues that I think he has as a player. He's also super experienced and he's huge. So he's going to be a, you know, a guy in his physical prime playing against 19 and 20 year olds as like a 25 year old. So that's helpful. Behind him is Kevin Klein, who was a starter and a tackle during the, the bad year uh, before he got hurt. He's intriguing. You got Dwayne Alec, who I like him as a, if, if you need him to start for one game, it's like, okay, we can game plan around this. That's fine. But he provides versatility on the interior. And then you got the young guys like Jack Funk and Otto Hess, who at this point, I would rather see what they have than just use a scholarship or whatever on transfer in terms of this position. So I'm fine with the depth with the interior offensive line as it stands. Edge defender is very concerning to me. Linebacker, it's it's a bit murky right now just because of Bryce Steele's status, and I don't think Jalen Blackwell's going to be ready for the beginning of the season. He might come back later because of when his injury happened last year. Corner, I'm okay with. I think they've got some guys there that I, I want to see what they can do. Uh, Max Tucker, Bryce Grease Brown, Ryan Turner, uh, Kari Johnson. And safety, again, a little weird considering – where we are with Cam Martinez on his transfer window, you know, it's just, you, you worry about it. Cause like, okay, you're, I'm, I'm not going to feel confident about it until he's here and he's practicing. Um, but besides that, like you, we talked about bug Jones being interesting. Jalen cheek is switching from corner to safety. So that's, you know, could be okay. And then KP price, a sophomore who played well to end the year is seems to be one of the other starters, just not a lot of depth and experience there that I feel comfortable with. So if you can go out and find a safety that has that, that's great. Um, so I would say safe. I would say, Edge is my number one need. Safety is my number two. And then some combination of linebacker, corner, and interior offensive line. All right. So in a moment, we're going to go to the biggest overreaction of the spring game, the quarterback. As we've heard a lot about Grayson James and how some people think that he should be taking over for Thomas Castellanos. We'll get into that and talk a little bit about where we think this is going in just a moment. It's playoff time in the NBA and NHL and baseball's in full swing and FanDuel is your place to bet on every game. Right now, new customers get 150 bucks in bonus bets guaranteed. That's 150 bucks win or lose. Now, if you're like me, you're watching some baseball, I'm watching it um, reluctantly, and I think I'm going to fade on every Red Sox game from here on out. Uh, take the money line against them and just keep rolling. I think I'm going to be a rich man by the end of this season, the way they're playing lately. So you could do the same thing. You can bet on everything from slap shots to home runs to slam dunks all on an app that is safe, secure, and easy to use. What are you waiting for? Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and make your first bet an automatic win. John Henry may not spend money, but FanDuel will. So check out FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Now, I can't wait to tell you about this new, our newest um, partner here on Locked On BC, and that's our friends over at Monopoly Go. I've been told I'm a, a competitive person. Mitch, do you think that's true? Perhaps not as competitive as me, especially when it comes to Monopoly, but I would agree with that. <laughs> okay, well, I have a competitive side. I mean, we all do. And my competitive side is a big fan of Monopoly Go. I'm sure you've heard of it. It's been downloaded over 150 million times. It's a great twist on Monopoly where you play 
on not one, but hundreds of monopoly boards in crazy locations, building up cr amazing cities that bring you big money. But the first big, the best part is messing with my friends. I can charge them rent on iconic properties, just like classic Monopoly, but now I can also rob their vaults of riches for myself. And the leaderboards show me the who is the biggest Monopoly tycoon. It's not just about the competitive side that I love. You can team up with friends and people all around the world in time tournaments to earn huge rewards. So get in the game and join your friends. Download Monopoly Go now free on the App Store or Google Play. This is Locked On Boston College, AJ Black here. And so uh, during the spring game, I made a, a pact to myself. And I said, you know, the, this is like the third straight spring game that I took my kids to. The first I took my daughter. I took my son to the last two. Um, I decided I, I don't really want to sit in the press box because I don't think the press is all that interested in actually watching the game. They, they seem to just chat a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and I wanted to actually kind of focus, and I find staying in the fans is actually more focusing. I can actually focus more there than I can up at the press box. So side note there, right? So I took my kids, and I was in a – it was crowded at this game, and around me was a lot of people that were watching the game, and of course the player that every fan that loves BC talks about is the quarterback position. And by the end of this scrimmage, all I could hear about from everyone around me was, wow, Grayson James should be the starting quarterback. He's got a better arm than Thomas Castellanos. Castellanos shouldn't be on the bench. He hasn't thrown a good pass all day. Heard this the entire scrimmage. Mitch, what did you think? What did we say about backup quarterbacks? They're the most popular person on the team. Ding, ding, ding. Yep. And I'm... You know, before we begin the discussion, I will couch this in the fact that, you know, when Thomas Castellanos transferred in last spring slash summer, we said, oh, you know, we don't, he's probably not going to be the starter. They're going to have packages for him, blah, blah, blah. And then he ended up taking the starting job eventually, you know, very quickly. So we were wrong there. Um, I, especially, I was wrong there. Um, and honestly, I think that there is more, based on what I've seen from these players, I think there is more to this controversy slash overreaction than there was last year so that's how i feel about it but i will say this when i was watching the spring game and part of the issue is that they would cut away and they i guess they have to do commercial breaks because you know and they just like skipped over entire drives so i think i did miss end up missing the long throw james had to reed harris which they did say on the broadcast that he did step out of bounds so i'm not sure if they were saying he was out of bounds when he caught the ball or he was at it, he caught the ball, went out of bounds and it should have been at the two yard line, but they just called it a touchdown, but I digress. So I, I miss, there's some plays that we just didn't see, or at least I didn't see but when I'm watching it. And I'm watching how the game is being called for Thomas Castellanos and Grace James. I felt it was different. And I think you mentioned this yesterday that I thought that the whistle was a lot quicker for Castellanos. And I thought it was longer for Grace and James. And I think this was intentional by Bill O'Brien because he wants to, develop Castellanos as a pocket passer, work on the stuff that he is not as good at, as, as you said yesterday. We already know Thomas Castellanos is a great runner. He can get out of the pocket. He can make electric plays with his legs. We know that. He needs to develop as a pocket passer. I think that Bill O'Brien is being very intentional about developing that skill set. And from what you've told me from what I'm seeing from the practice reports, it seems like during practice, he is doing better at that. It was just, you know, early to start this game. You know, I know Lewis Bond wasn't out there. Uh, you have different offensive line combinations. So, you know, things you know not everything's going perfectly for him um compared to grayson james he did have some nice throws i will give him that and he stands tall in the pocket and that's great he does have some mobility so that's great so i feel very comfortable with him if if castellanos gets hurt and he needs to come in and run the offense however i felt that a lot of grace he has I'm, i want to say he did have some nice throws deep and over the middle but i felt most of his throws or most of his completions, at least. And this is why his completion rate was so high in the, in the stats for the spring game. And we can, <laughs> that's a whole other discussion. Um, I felt a lot of his throws were check downs uh, where he had, and he also had a lot of time in the pocket where again, Bill O'Brien was giving him more time and he was checking it down to the running back, to the tight ends in the flat to Luke McLaughlin in the flat. So, you know, whereas I felt Castellanos was really trying to execute the plays as they were designed and throw the ball deep in the deep and intermediate part of the field a little more. Try in a sense, he was trying harder throws than James was, and, and this was especially 
uh, the case during the end of game situational drill they did where they were simulating that it was less than a minute to go, no timeouts. You know, you gotta gotta go win the game. And the first time they did it, Castellanos hit three passes, including that one you mentioned, which was the dime to skeet on the fade route, had three great plays, touchdown. So they go, okay, one's out, two's in. Two's come in. James checks it down two or three times, and then he takes two sacks. And I'm like, okay. So then they put the ones back out there, and Castellanos didn't have, I think he missed on the first one. He might have missed the second one, too. Third play, this one is it's a bit weird because it probably should have been a sack, but they let him get out of the pocket, and then he threw a touchdown, but he's probably beyond the line of scrimmage, so it probably shouldn't have counted, but he throws a touchdown. Yeah, he was way off <laughs> Yes, <laughs> from watching it. And th- But then the next drive, Jason Grayson James comes back in again. I think he checks down twice, one of which in the field of play, so the clock is running, and then he throws an interception. So I think that what this tells me, and this is from what I've seen with Castellanos in general, and I've only seen a bit of Grayson James, and I obviously haven't seen them practice, so I don't know. But I think there is something to it that Castellanos just has the big game gene, you know, the clutch gene, if you will, where once the lights are, and obviously it's still the spring game, once the lights are on and the intensity is turned up, like he is the guy to go to because he's going to make something happen. And obviously his ability to create explosive plays with his legs give him that boost. So yes, I think you could argue that Grayson James is a better pocket passer than Thomas Castellanos, but the fact that Thomas Castellanos can do so much with his legs, create outside the pocket, both as a runner and a thrower, that's huge. I felt during the spring when I was watching, I said this to you, I felt that Thomas Castellanos was trying to ace the test, whereas Grayson James was just trying to pass the test. And there are times when you do need that. And I think that is what Bill O'Brien is trying to teach Castellanos. We don't need to hit these big game shots all the time. You don't need to be doing all this. You don't, we want you to learn how to run the offense just by completing these easy passes, learning to check down a little more. Although for him, his check down is his leg, so that's fine. Um, so that's kind of how I feel about all this. And obviously there's the caveat that all of James's stuff was against the second team. And again, I did say I was impressed by how the defense performed. But, you know, him operating with his offense with a uh, – and obviously he has the number twos with him as well. But I, I also – I'm not sure how much this matters, but I, I think it could be a relevant variable is that I get the sense that or maybe the ones, there's a, a bit more movement of who is with them – Whereas James might have a little more chemistry with working with the twos because that's a little more stable where, you know, you kind of like a guy like Reed Harris, like Reed Harris is pretty much always going to be with the twos because Deron Bradley is with the ones Uh, a guy like uh, Luke McLaughlin, or uh, I'm trying to think of who the other receivers were with the twos, but like Dino Tomlin, even Dino got a good amount of run with the ones as well, but those guys are pretty much always working with the twos. They're not getting plucked up as much to work with the ones like with like Jane Skeet was and Castellano showed some good chemistry with him. So I think that maybe he has just has some more chemistry with the set, like the second tier of receivers because they're working with him more. Whereas Castellanos is kind of trying out different things, different receivers. I might be overthinking this, but I just, I obviously I feel this is overreaction. Spring games are very weird. Um, They're kind of built to, you know, garner interest and stir up some controversy, but I, I feel pretty strong. Again, I, I, I do feel that there's more smoke here than the quote unquote controversy last year. But I still feel very strong that Castellanos is going to be the starter week one and is probably going to be the starter for most of, if not all, of the season, barring injury. We could also talk about it in another episode, whether BC should go to what Ole Miss did during their spring game, where they had hot dog, they had Joey Chestnut doing a hot dog eating contest. They had all sorts of crazy crap. Um, And honestly, you know, there's something after after what after what uh, allegedly was going on with uh, Father (laughs) Leahy laying down the law. In terms of students having fun, I can't imagine he would allow that kind of chicanery to happen. Yeah, no. Anyways, Mitch, we're 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 running low on time here. Where can people find your work? You can find me at Mitchell T. Wolf, W O L F E on Twitter. Um, probably won't have a spring game reaction because uh, it's kind of going to be the same thing we are here, and I don't feel like kind of playing into some of these narratives. But um, NFL drafts coming up soon. We've got my scattering reporter Christian Mahogany's up on the site. We'll have ones for Elijah Jones and Kyle Hergel. Uh, so that obviously drafted next week, so that's big. And then. I'm working on some other stuff, some this big linebacker project, which I'm hoping to get done in the next week or so, but it's a big thing, so it could take a little while. But just make sure you check out Eagle Insider. Got, excuse me, tons of great information there. Um, obviously, DC Hockey Blogger, you know, the season didn't end the way we wanted, but his writing about the hockey team is so interesting and so informative about the sport. So can't recommend highly enough that you guys check out our content there. And we'll also have Beacon Street Ball um, 
breaking down the two new transfers uh, for the basketball team coming up. Mm-hmm. Um, so make sure to check that out. And if you're listening on Tuesday, we're having a transfer Palooza sale for an Eagle Insider VIP annual subscription. If you sign up for a year, it's sixty percent off. Uh, make sure you take advantage of that. Head over to Eagle Insider today. It's like a cup of coffee for uh, per month. I mean, just lay off your Starbucks, support our work. You'll love it. So check out that. That's that starts on um, at midnight tonight. So check that out. Thank you, Mitch. Um, and in a moment, I'm going to get into recruiting as BC lands two commitments on Marathon Monday. I'll explain who they are and why you should be excited. I'll get into all of that in just a moment. When you're hiring for your small business, you want to find professionals that are right for your job. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs has the tools to help you find the right professionals for your team faster and for free. LinkedIn isn't just a job board. LinkedIn helps you hire professionals that you can't find anywhere else. Even those who aren't actively searching for a new job might be open to the perfect role. In a given month, over 70% of LinkedIn users don't visit other job sites. So if you're looking on LinkedIn, you're looking for the wrong place. So if you're not looking looking on LinkedIn, excuse me, on LinkedIn, 86% of small businesses get a qualified candidate within 24 hours. You're going to fill your job quick and easy. Hire professionals like a professional on LinkedIn. Go, go and post your job for free at LinkedIn.com slash locked on college. That's LinkedIn.com slash locked on college. Post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. This is Locked On Boston College. I'm your host, AJ Black. Loved having Mitch on. We're going to get into a little bit of recruiting here as Boston College landed two commitments on Marathon Monday. You guys were out watching that marathon going on. I had uh, flybys going by my house at like 8 o'clock. It was crazy. It sounded like, you know, warplanes going over my head. But they were all going to the Boston Marathon. Um, And if you were listening, uh, you were probably missing out on all the recruiting news going on for BC football. BC's first commitment of the day came from Zavarian Brothers in Massachusetts, and that is Micah Amity. Micah Amity is a 6'3", 280-pound interior defensive lineman, and I've heard nothing but good things about this kid. He doesn't have a ton of big offers, but 247 rated him an 87, which is a high three-star. That's a lot. Um, and I could tell you the national analysts I talked to love this kid. He would have if he, if BC did not push on him, they would have he would have got more offers. But he told me that BC was his dream school and that he was quick to say that I wanted to commit to them the minute they offered me, but I didn't want to rush it. You know, Zavarian Brothers, that's a school Henry Hasselback went to. There's a lot of good talent that goes to that school. This kid's a big dude. And if he, uh, I was talking to Brian Doan, 247, said, you know, he's got some technique stuff that he's going to work on in college, but he's a perfect ACC defensive tackle, he said. And he's the kind of guy that Boston College should go after, direct quote. So this is a good get. And this kind of lines into what Bill O'Brien has said this whole first two months, is that he wants to really put the emphasis on the, the Northeast. And this is the third Massachusetts recruit that he's landed in a month. He added Marcelino Antunes, a 26-0 line from Catholic Memorial, and Griffin Collins, an athlete slash linebacker from Worcester Academy. That is good. And he's got more coming down. You know, you're looking at guys like Tommy Rupley, um, uh, Hardy Watts. There's a few other names that they're looking at at that uh, from Massachusetts and Connecticut, you know, you get CJ Bell and Jordan Houston uh, from St. Thomas More. Bill O'Brien is really, he's really pushing for the Northeast. And Amity is a good one. He was at the spring game on Saturday. He was actually sitting right over my shoulder. I could see him hit, sitting with Hasselback. Um, but there was a whole Severian brother group there. Uh, that was his second visit in like two weeks. He just got offered about a week ago and he loved it. He had, you know, so this is a good get. I know you're going to look at this and say, oh, AJ, the Power 5 offers aren't there and whatnot. If the scouts on 247 and Rivals both like him. So I trust Brian Doan. It, he, he, me and him, we talk a lot. If he likes this kid, I think you guys should too. The second commitment came that night. This is Tyree Green uh, from, from Ohio. He's a defensive back. Now, 
Tyree Green was also on, I think he was the same day that um, he's from Reynoldsburg, Ohio. He's a 5'11 offensive um, a defensive back who is fast. Now, Alan True, who is a uh, 247 writer, said he ran a 10.71 in the 100 meter dash. He shows short area burst and change of direction in addition to pure recovery and closing speed. Lean frames but plays physically and uses all his listed speed. Size, he needs to fill in and get stronger still, but is a sure tackle who doesn't shy away from contact. Love the potential here. BC got in on quick, and when I we talked to Green, he noticed that the staff really showed that they cared about him. They loved what they saw. So he, again, just like, just like uh, Amity, does not have a ton of offers. And that's okay. So what I want to tell you is some of the kids you're going to see now are guys that are players that they analyze, they see, that are local kids or kids from areas that they're pushing in, and Ohio is a definite area they're pushing in, that other schools may not see yet. The names, the bigger names, the four stars, the ones that have huge offer lists, those commitments are going to come after official visits. Those are in June. That's when you're going to see the bigger names. So right now, you're going to see, mo- and you may see a few that are, are have some offers, but mostly you're going to see guys that have smaller offer lists that come and visit, and the staff has seen their film and they th- or and met the kid, and they're saying, oh, this is a kid we want to get right away. So this is all based on an analysis. This is going to be something you're going to watch in a couple of years and say, oh, you know, maybe he transfers away. Oh, that, you know, O'Brien whiffed on that one. Or he's a starting cornerback in three years. Yeah, they got him. You know, they got him nice and early. That was a good get. He's an 87 as well. So again, the analysts on 247 like this kid. Like what they got here. BC right now has the 51st rated recruiting class. They have five commitments. I don't see any more commitments coming up soon. I, I, I'll i be checking out to see if there's any visitors this week because I think it's still live. But we'll see. And But I, as I said with Mitch when he was just on, well, it's all see a transfer portal. I expect a name or two that you're not going to, you're going to be floored by. You may be surprised by that's going to enter the portal that they're going to have to go and address. It's going to happen. New coach, the way that the portal's working right now, it's going to happen. Thank you all so much. We, we went long, 35 minutes for this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. My name's AJ Black. Follow me along on, on 247 Sports on Eagle Insider. Again, 60% off. Make sure you take advantage of that offer right now. And I hope to see you on tomorrow's episode where we're going to be looking at the transfer portal and everything in between. Thank you for listening to Locked On Boston College, your only daily Boston College podcast. We love each and every one of you. And this is Locked On BC, your team every day.